Now, I meant to say, m make it one more extra announcement before I get started with the sermon this morning. Um, I'm going to be taking, I'm going to call it requests, but uh, I I'm interested in hearing from the congregation uh, maybe either doctrines or difficult passages of scripture that, that have always been maybe a little bit, you've been a little confused about, a little bit uncertain about as ideas for me to, to, to be able to preach on and teach on, uh, on on various issues. So if you've come across things, I'm sure like everybody probably has something that you've come across and been like, this seems a little bit odd. I'm not quite sure exactly what this is saying. Write that down. Write down the, the, the passage as well as what, what you are seeing as a problem or, or a misunder, uh, you know, what you're not understanding about it, right? So like um, if you just write down a reference, I might have no idea what, you know, you think is confusing about or whatever. So, um, or, you know, some might be more obvious than others. I don't know, but uh, just, just do that. If you, if you have anything like that and then just submit them to me, you could text me, you could email me, you can drop it off in my office or whatever. Um, I am interested in that. I want to be able to, to cover some topics that uh, you might have always wanted no answers for. And it doesn't mean I'm going to get to all of them because it doesn't mean that I necessarily have all of the answers to everything because I don't claim to have all the answers to everything. But, um, I just wanted to make that announcement, so please uh, feel free to do that. And it doesn't have to be just now, just for this time. Anytime uh, you have something like that, uh, please just, just drop stuff off for me. I'd be happy to uh, help you with those areas. All right. Uh, Isaiah 59 here. I'm going to be focusing on the last verse where the Bible says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. And I want to preach on the preservation of God's word. We have a very powerful passage right here in Isaiah uh, 59, that last verse, that is very clearly stating that, look, this is, you know, my words, you know, according to the Lord, this is, this is my covenant, my spirit that's upon me and my words which I put in your mouth, right? And this is what we believe about Scripture, is that it's the word of God. This isn't just the word of man. These are God's words that we really care about. It's what we want to know. It's what we need to know. It's what we need to live by is the word of God. And he says that my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, right? Nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed from henceforth, forever. So it's like, here's the starting point from here on forward. It's not going to depart. And that, if that's true, right, if the word of God is true, then it must continue forever. And this is one passage that can point us to the doctrine that we believe in and hold tight to that God has promised to preserve his words throughout the generations, okay? And I am not, this morning, I'm not going to go through all of the, the passages that will support this doctrine from Scripture. I actually want to take a different approach and, and just, I, I want to make sure everyone's clear with the, with the understanding and, and the purpose of this. And many of you, if you're following social media, probably understand where this is coming from to begin with. If not, that's fine because you will, um, I'll explain it a little bit later at the end of the sermon what uh, what kind of prompted all of this, but I this subject of you know for one we're King James only church which means that we only exclusively use the King James version of the Bible in English for our Bible for this church. We believe that that Bible is the preserved Word of God. We believe that it is inerrant. We believe that it uh, it, it is just as authoritative and just as powerful as the original Hebrew and Greek texts that were given to the men of God, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We believe it is on the level with that. Even though it is a translation, we don't think that it is a subpar to the original languages that the word of God was given to us in. But also, we don't believe that it is superior to the original languages that it was written in either. And what I, what the reason I'm preaching a sermon, one of the reasons is because with many, many doctrines, we want to be careful 
not to go too far in any one direction that would make it outside of, of what is true, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, take an example, uh, for example, a doctrine of like the Trinity, okay? You could, y y there's reasons to preach about different things depending, especially depending on what's going on at any given time. So the more influence people like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons are having and they're going out and they're reaching people to spread in these damnable heresies that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh, that he was just a man or that he's Michael the Archangel or so, you know, these, these other doctrines that are reaching a lot of people, well, you need to fight against that, right? And teach good doctrine and teach the deity of Christ and show and, ex and, and, and express, look, Jesus Christ is God incarnate, right? And, and fight for those truths and fight for that faith. But in so doing, you don't want to get so wrapped up and go to an extreme where now you're losing sight of, you know, where, where it's, you know, Jesus is God. Yes, absolutely he's God. But Jesus is not the Father. We don't believe in the oneness doctrine that then completely merges Father, Son, and Holy Ghost into just like it's the Jesus only movement or whatever, right? That's, that's taking things too far to an extreme with something that may start off good, be like, yes, we got to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. It's good. But you don't want to go too far. And similarly with the Word of God, and when it comes to KJV only ism, right, as like a movement or whatever, people who subscribe to the King James Bible as being the preserved Word of God. Some people will take this way too far to an extreme and will, will even say that like the, the translators were inspired in the sense that like they're directly getting this revelation from God or whatever to, 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 get, to get these words placed, you know, precisely and... and, and that there, there couldn't ever possibly be anything else, uh, any other word even that could be used to translate other than what the King James translators wrote down, okay? And what I'm gonna show you, hopefully conclusively for yourself, is that that is too far of an extreme, and, and to use a simple example would be people who would say that like, you know, even a synonym of a word could never be replaced in a translation, and then you, then you can't call that the word of God, right? This is an extreme that people will take that doesn't line up with, with Scripture, I would say, and we're going to see that because we're going to look at various quotations within Scripture. We're going to look at the degree of... of um, precision, I, you might want to call it, in the renderings of translating, like especially we're, we're going to look at it a little bit later, New Testament quotations of Old Testament. Old Testament we know is written in Hebrew, and we're going to see, and, and we're reading all of this in English, and we're going to see how the Greek was rendered, rendering the Hebrew with both of those being rendered in English to us, okay, and see you, you, what you'll find out, and, and we'll, see this, we'll see this in specific examples, you don't have literal exact word for word, every single word, every single article being identical when they're quoting the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that it's wrong or in error. But what does it mean? Well, words are important, right? And we believe in an every word Bible. We believe that, and it's true. But what do you mean by that, right? So you, you hear this good teaching, and you say, look, I believe that we need every word of God. Amen and amen. But if you had a translation, for example, that instead of eternal, it said everlasting, just, just as one simple example, and that was all that was switched, like, is that not the word of God? Is that any less the word of God? If, it, if, if a, a direct synonym was used to say the exact same thing, I would say no. That doesn't, that's not changing the word of God. That doesn't corrupt the word of God. That hasn't done anything. And if you get too crazy on this, what, what you're going to end up having a lot of problems historically. And what I mean by that is, you know, 
you're going to have a lot to answer for throughout history if you get too out of bounds with your belief on, on what, you know, what's going to be called a corruption or an error in the word of God. And what I'm going to do today is challenge you to consider this and think about it because at the end of the day, what should matter for all of us is the truth. No matter what is the truth. Bottom line, what is true, not necessarily even what have I, you know, what has someone told me for my whole life, what is true. And when I got started in the ministry, my, my whole goal with everything is truth. That's why the, the name of the first church that I pastored was called Word of Truth, because that, that is the goal. That's what I care about. I want to know the truth, no matter what that is and what that says. And look, don't get worried or nervous or think that Pastor Burns, look, I haven't changed my mind on this from anything that I've preached. I have grown in my understanding because this is a complicated subject and there's no way to hit all the points about translations and about the King James Bible and about the history about everything in one sermon or in two or in three or in four there's there's so much to the subject but I'm gonna do my best to try to, to, to illustrate a few points and one of the reasons why I want to do this is so that you're not shaken in your faith because hopefully as you know and look I've been preaching this forever about being able to hear other people's points of view, being able to listen to people who challenge your point of view, right, and be able to listen to it and be able to, to hear and say, okay, what are their points? I will, you know, not, I don't want to call it frequently, but occasionally, I'll, I'll read what an atheist has to say about the Bible. I'll read the supposed contradictions in the Bible. I'll look at this stuff. I'll hear what they have to say. I'll listen to other doctrines that I believe to be false. Because when you look at things, even if you already know them to be false, it can help you still to find any flaws in your own reasoning, in your own understanding, in your own support for what you believe, because sometimes the other sides will find the holes or flaws in your arguments. And they'll point them out. And they'll, and they'll try to trip you up. And look, if you're interested in the truth, you'll have to recognize sometimes when you go, you know what, yeah, I kind of thought this way, but that's wrong. That, 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 that doesn't hold water. That doesn't stand. It doesn't mean that everything you believe is wrong. But you have to have the proper understanding of what is true, what is right. And what God has promised here, literally, is that his words were going to be brought forward to every generation. So right off the bat, we can trust and know that God's word has been preserved. Amen. So the people that want to say, well, we don't actually quite know, we can't really know, you know, we have our best guesses and we have our best, like, no, that's not true. God has preserved his word through all generations, and we have no reason to doubt that at all. And I'm going to bring up some very variations in the King James Bible text, not to shake your faith, but to show you that you can still, you, 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 could, you could have the right doctrine, but you don't want to get too crazy out of bounds with, with things that might, sh you know, might even shake your faith, especially if you hear this from someone that's going to try to say, oh no, KJV says its errors and its flaws and things like that. It's, it's not true, but we need to have a good understanding of what the scripture's saying and what does it actually mean. So, point number one, we could say in our doctrine here is the King James Bible is inerrant and infallible, but what does that even mean? What does the King James Bible mean? What does it mean that the King James Bible, because it's easy, these are the things you're going to be hearing preached and, and preached hard on over and over and over again, but... Well, what, what does that mean? If you, if you open up your Bible and I open up my Bible from different publishers, you may find some differences. You will find, depending on the publisher, differences. I'm going to go over, if you have an Oxford versus a Cambridge, for example, you will have some different words in your Bible. Well, what's right? The KJV, are we talking about the 1611? Are we talking about any other revision since then? Are we talking about the 1769? 
which one? Okay, now look, these are arguments that some people will try to make to shake your faith in the KJV and to try to trip you up and to see like, well, what, you know, but that doesn't change the doctrine of preservation. It doesn't change anything. The translation was still correct when it was made. And the translation still stands. Various publishers or printers, though, God hasn't promised that every single person who would ever put into print his word would do it without error. And when you look at history, we know that's the case. And what you have to understand is where we stand in history right now also shapes and helps us understand and, and even form some of our doctrines. But you, but you have to consider, you know, post the time of the printing press, the, the era we live in right now, where mass production of documents, of books, of papers, of things like that, where you can do typesetting and, and have like, like a solid, just like this is it, and I could just mass produce this. That is, that is new in human history. It's newer. It's not the way things have always been. And what we've had, God's preservation through even the original languages has been by people copying the word of God. And we know for a fact that not every copy that has been used and used by churches of the word of God has had every single word exactly correct in that book, in that, tra in that paper, in that copy. We know that. And you can know that even the source, the underlying documentation, the, the Greek text of the New Testament, the King James Bible, the Textus Receptus, again, you know, and this is, this is going a little deep, but I want you to think about these things, understand them, and dig into them so you can just know, hey, what is the truth? And you can be right about the doctrine and about where things come from. The, 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 the New Testament that we rely on, that the King James Bible, and look, there's many reasons that I could tell you why and show you why the King James Bible is right from Scripture. I've done that in other, in other passages, and I still believe that 100% today. It is the only translation in English that I'm aware of that is faithful to the... Uh, you know, the underlying Greek and Hebrew texts. But the, the received text, the Textus Receptus, was a compilation of other manuscripts. Now, it wasn't some vast amount. Still, the majority, the vast majority of those, and I should have had more per, like uh, statistics for you to present just so you could understand the clarity and how much similarity there is between these passages that were used, what, what, what you end up with is the refining of making sure that everything is right when you really dig down into the variances, into the textual differences in the underlying documents that, that compiles the Texas Receptus. But the Texas Receptus was not any one specific document that just made its way all the way up to the 1500s or whatever. It's not. I mean, it's a fact. Okay, fact. So, first of all, you have to deal with that. You have to deal with that. What do you do? What do I do? There's not one document that had all of the books of the New Testament in one that we would say that right now in English just matched up perfectly every single word, every single time, 100%. You have to do something with that. Did God fail at his preservation? No, because words were all still there. Did someone make a mistake somewhere along the way in making a copy? Yeah. Now, we can reconcile these things because you could look at and compare the various copies and the various editions that are out and you can be, in, and be able to see what changes were made. You can see, there's, there's, you know, and again, the whole process of checking that out becomes a little bit complicated. You want to dig in and get into the weeds on this. It's, it's not just super simple. But it's also something that shouldn't have to shake 
your faith in the Word of God and coming across items that have been different. Now, I'm gonna, I have a few differences here just to start off with between the 1611 print, printed copy of the KJV and what we would commonly be using today as a 1769 revision. Now, 1769 is 158 years after 1611, just in case you're not good with math. 158 years is a long time. I mean, that's two lifetimes. So what do you do for the generation? Let's say you were born in 1650. And you spoke English. And you didn't speak Greek or Hebrew. Did you have a Bible available for you that you can say is the word of God? Yeah, I believe so. But you know what you would have found? And you could, follow, you could turn, if you want to, in these, to these verses with me. Joshua chapter 3 is one example we're going to look at, verse number 11. And, and I'll tell you this, I'm going to go over this stuff, and, and some people will respond, and they're going to get all emotional, and say, look at Pastor Persons, he's, he's saying there's errors in the King James, and he's not really King James only, and, he, you know, and they're going to throw shade on me for showing you the truth. And I want, you know, it, instead of coming up with some emotional response, and just saying like, oh man, look at King, Pastor Persons is doing this or doing that, I want you to look at the facts for yourself because you have to do something with this. Joshua 3, verse 11, the Bible says, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. The 1611 version says, Behold, the ark of the covenant, even the Lord of all the earth, passeth over before you into Jordan. That's different. It's not the same. That's what it read. You could look it up for yourself. You can go and get the, the, the copy, the facsimile of the 1611 and verify this for yourself. In fact, I have one in my office. If you want to check any of these, you can see it. 2 Kings 11 verse 10. Now, this doesn't mean, this wasn't the translation. This is what got put into print. This is the print. This isn't a, a wrong translation. 2 Kings 11, verse 10. You'll read, And to the captains over hundreds did the priest give King David spears and shields that were in the temple of the Lord. What you'll find in 1611 is, Identical word for word, everything without of the Lord at the end of that passage. And one more example, because I don't want to I don't want to keep on going over this too much. Uh, Jeremiah 31. And these are like the worst, the worst possible variations or differences, okay, in between the 1611 and 1769 of all the changes that were made. Because the vast majority are literally just like spelling difference. Okay, they're, 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 so, they're, they're not even worth talking about if you're going to get that ridiculous on making an update or a change. Okay, I'm just showing you I, what I consider to be what I could look at and say, okay, well, there's, there's some different, there's something there that's different. Jeremiah 31, 14 says, and I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. In the 1611, my, in the my goodness, was left out. Now, satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with goodness, saith the Lord. Okay, fact. We have these facts, right? Now, why am I bringing up these facts? Because I don't, again, I don't want your faith to be shaken, first of all, but two, 
I want your understanding to be correct in how we view things and how we view, for example, a printing error if something was printed because they all will exist. How do you deal with that? Is, is, should it be earth shattering? No, it should not be. One more place I want to turn is Ezekiel chapter 24. And what I'm also going to point out, and what we'll see this when I compare the Oxford versus the Cambridge editions, is that, funny enough, sometimes you can have two completely different words that can still provide the same exact meaning, the way that the grammar works. And that's what I believe about the differences between the Oxford and the Cambridge, actually, is that there is no difference. I'm getting just a little bit ahead of myself, but I just want, and you could think at first, how could that even possibly be, right? Like a, like a passage between ye and he, for example. You say, well, ye is the plural you, he is singular one person. In certain structures, <laughs> they can literally tell you the same, the same thing. And, and you may not even realize, like, how could that possibly be? I'll show you when we get to it, but... It is possible. It is possible. So these are the things that, that you know, we need to look at and consider, absolutely, but what is the truth, right? And, and how are we going to deal with this, and how does that affect our doctrine? Ezekiel 24, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, take the choice, and, and this is what we have, right? This would be after the revision, 1769. Take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it and make it boil well and let them seethe the bones of it therein, and let them see the bones of it therein. And then in the 1611, the Bible says, take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it and make it boil well and let him seethe the bones of it therein. And you'll see there a them and a him. And then in, in verse 7, you'll see, for her blood is in the midst of her, she set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust. The 1611 says, for her blood is in the, mid the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it upon the ground to cover it with dust. Missing the word not. Key word. Look, that's a problem, right? That's not, that wasn't correct. You needed to have that word not in there. How do you even find these things? Well, look at the context of Ezekiel 24. Look at verse number 6 is where we'll start reading. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece, let no lot fall upon it, for her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. In the context here, you would see a contradiction with that word not missing, of pouring it not upon the ground. Why? Because verse 8 was talking about God saying that I have set the blood upon the rock that it should not be covered. So it's talking about blood up on a rock. And they're saying that they didn't pour it out so that, the, that it would blend in with the dirt and the dust and then you wouldn't see the blood. Make sense? And God is pointing out here that I can see the blood, right? Like the blood that you're guilty of, right? You're, you're guilty of this stuff. You've got this blood on a rock. It's wide open to see. It's not being covered up in the dust. Well, the context is going to make it clear, like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense that it, that it says it's poured on the ground to hide it because it's not poured on the ground. So when people were reviewing the printing of the KJV, something like this, you could find that and say, wait, this doesn't look right. 
and then you could check it and you could check back to the, you know, the English translation, which was done by hand and compare that with what was printed. And then you also have the Greek and Hebrew underlying texts that were used as a translation to also verify the, the, what the text should be. Okay, these aren't earth shattering or groundbreaking, but we have to understand is that errors similar, to, and again, it's, it's not like it's some huge amount, it's just this really, really, really small amount of words that have been changed existed in print in the King James Bible from 1611 to 1768, first of all. So that shouldn't affect the doctrine of preservation for you. If it does, you might have you might have gone a little out of bounds in your understanding of preservation. Because first of all, were the Greek and the Hebrew preserved? They had to be in order to get the English translation. <laughs> they had to be. They had to be. That's how it was originally given. Were they still preserved? Yes. So here's one point, is if any translation says something different than what has already been preserved through the Greek and Hebrew, then the translation is wrong. Now, does that mean, well, you, I just can't trust this thing then? If it, would everyone just say like, well, that not was put in there and it was printed in there, and now I just can't even trust this translation. Is that reasonable to say that? I don't think so. Because if you open up your Bible, you may be able to find a typo in your Bible. You might find something that doesn't belong there. It's not correct. It doesn't mean you just throw out the whole book. Now, when we compare the King James translation with other modern translations, there's tons of differences, meaningful differences. There's, there's, there's all kinds of things that are changed. And, and this is the main problem, is you've got different underlying source texts that say different things and mean different things, and that matters. But when someone somewhere makes some mistake in the printing of a book, that should not and cannot shake your faith. Or else, or else you've, you're, you're, you're not understanding things right in how God has preserved his word. Now, and, and this is, some people get really, 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 really focused in on this stuff. And look, I'm all for being zealous for the word of God, 100%. Right? And we ought to be very diligent and very sure in, in making sure that, that you know, we're, when we're handling the word of God, we, we want to know everything and, and make sure there's no error. Like, like, this is really important to us. And thank God for the printing press and thank God for the ability to be able to typeset things and to be able to have these easily reproducible copies and things that we could have it published so, so far and wide and be able to rely on these things. Like this is uh, amazing. And, and, and that's, you know, again, one of the other reasons why we can trust in the King James Bible is how much it was widely used. You could see the fruit of that Bible with all the missionary work, with all the souls that were saved, with all the evangelism that was done using the KJV, going out to a lost world at the advent of the printing press and just being published far and wide, which is what God wants with his word anyways, right? There's so many different ways that you can see this, but we have to deal with these, uh, these differences. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 34. And I know this is a touchy subject, but you know, you can't let your emotions take over especially for those of us who, I mean, you live, eat, breathe, sleep, the KJV. And again, I'm not saying the KJV is wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong anywhere. Just so we're clear, I'm not saying it is wrong. There, there are any errors in the KJV. I don't believe that. But we have to have a proper understanding where everything is even coming from. And when you, you know, when you look at this, like you said, you have, to, you have to just see, well, if this is what it was like in history, what does that mean? What does it mean? 
And if there were a typographical error that were to persist, if it persisted for 158 years or 400 years, does that change anything? Does that change anything in the preservation of God's word? I don't believe so. We still have the underlying Greek and Hebrew still to this day, if there were any, if there were any. And again, I'll get to that at the end. I'm going to just cover what I think about that last little thing that there might potentially be some typographical error uh, that has come up. But, but that's a whole, that's getting, getting ahead of myself. I want to go over this Oxford versus Cambridge because who's familiar with Oxford versus Cambridge? Okay, a few people. A few people are aware of this. This is something, and look, I'll admit too, when I was younger and had, you know, still learning a lot more about the King James Bible, this was very important to me, and, and I didn't know what to do about this, because there's a lot, let me put it this way too, there's a lot of resources on, on KJV onlyism, a lot out there, but not every person who supports it has good arguments, and not every person has, has, the right reasons or the right uh, stance even on the KJV. So it's easy to start reading and, 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 and learning and, and seeing what other people are saying about it and be influenced by that, but you gotta make sure that even what they're saying is true. You say, well, I've already been convinced about the KJV, but it doesn't mean every source that supports it is accurate. New Age, uh, New, New Age Bible versions, for example. Gail Ripplinger put out this book. There's good information in there, but there's also some false information in there. Okay, so you don't want to take that work and then just trust that everything that that says is just inherently true, and you might end up walking away, one, with bad arguments where someone could just prove you wrong from, or maybe even just have a warped view of exactly how we ought to... Uh, you know, the conclusions that we make on, on translations and stuff, right? So, and that's just one example. There's, there's plenty of other examples similar to that, right? Jeremiah 34, verse 16. Now, I'm just curious. I'm just going to be curious to see. I'm going to ask for a show of hands as we start reading this, where the difference is. Ox, Jeremiah 34, verse 16, the Bible says, But ye turned and polluted my name, and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom, now, whose Bible says ye? Okay, whose Bible says he? So less people says he, more say ye, but we definitely have a mix. All right, there's more people that say ye. You gotta have the he. Get out of here, you heathens. <laughs> Throw that thing in the trash. No, but, but look, now, now, all joking aside, right, it's still a serious matter, right? Like, like it, 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 you, you want to be able to say, well, wait a minute, though. Okay, those are two different words, and they mean two different things, he and ye, right? So we got to be sincere and want to know, well, what, what's true? What is right? I mean, do we have to make a, a, a choice on this and say this is right and this is wrong? Because we want to know on every single detail, 100%, of course. I want to know what the truth is. This is why I studied this out a while, uh, quite a while ago. Because uh, you get introduced with this stuff, and it's like, well, well, which one's right? Well, let's look at the grammar of the sentence and see what they mean. What do they mean? Verse 16, let's read it slowly, okay? But ye turned and polluted my name, and caused every man his servant, and every man his handmaid. Now, there are two, there, there's the ye that the verse starts off with, y'all, right? That's, that, that would be the southern version of, of the Bible, y'all. Y'all turned and polluted my name. And then switches to cause every man his servant and every man his. So, now you have that singular his, but it's also still referencing every man. 
So even before we get to the year he, do you see how in the grammatical structure there's, there's the you all and the every man with the singular being applied to every man? Now, whom ye had set at liberty is correct, because it's y'all, he's talking to the group, but in this structure, and every man his servant, every man his handmaid, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure, could also be correct, because right preceding that, I was talking about every man his, every man his, whom he had. You didn't think that you could make ye and he the same, right? But it's the same meaning. It's the same meaning. It's talking about every man of all of them. So, what do you do with that? Nope. It has to be this or it has to be that. Well, also remember this is a translation. And the way translations work, you won't be able to just take every literal word and just take a dictionary of, uh, a, a, in this case, a, a Hebrew English dictionary, and then just swap out every word and have that make sense. It, the translations don't work that way. Right? Now, in the King James translation, it was the right approach of the authors doing their best to maintain a literal translation, meaning that we are going to trust the authority of this scripture, of this text, and faithfully render what it says without adding meaning behind what it's saying, but you still have to understand what it's saying, like, like on the surface level, right? What happens oftentimes with translations and bad translations, people introduce their doctrine and let that change the rendering of a translation. You can't do that. You have to be able to, to be you know, true to the word to be able to say, well, this is what it says and just faithfully be able to translate what it says. But in grammar, you're going to have choices sometimes of how do you render this from this language to this one. And you'll have a choice to make. And that doesn't mean if you have two options that are both equally accurate in making the translation, it doesn't make one any more true than the other. And in the King James Bible, there's words that they definitely use synonyms because you don't want to always just use the same exact word. It just sounds weird. And there were, there were choices made in the translation to make it sound good. Now, they weren't adding or removing from the word of God in order to do this. But when you're, when you're taking the whole and you have options, well, how are you going to render that? It's not always cut and dry of just saying, well, it has to just be this one or it has to be that one. Not always. Where it is, it absolutely matters, and it needs to be right, correct, right? But when you have a choice, we have to have the ability to say, okay. And along those same lines, you know, there's going to come a day, probably, where English will change enough significantly from the words that were used to be able to say, look, People just aren't getting the meaning anymore from the Word of God. And that already exists to a small degree today. When you read the King James Bible, there are some words that have become outdated and don't mean what we use them for today. And you'll hear that in the preaching. And the concern is, well, the more words change, then the farther away people will get from their understanding of what the Word of God is supposed to say, like what it actually says, if words change too much. And I don't think we're at the point, 
And most KJV only people aren't thinking we're like, we're like, oh, language has changed to the point where we need to just now do a revision or an update to the Bible. I don't think we need to do that. But we need to be smart. We need to know our English. We need to make sure that we're understanding the word of God right. And there is a concept out there. There is a, um, these things exist. There's things that are called false friends in a language where you think a word means one thing or it does mean something today that it didn't mean before, where, where the, 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 the meaning has changed. And we need to be aware of those things and study those things out and make sure that we're correct, correct in our understanding of what the Word of God says. There's um, another example for between Oxford and Cambridge. That's the first one. Um, you know what? I'm not even going to go through all these because I'm already running short on time. You can look them up for yourself. There's one where one, one will say sin. The other one says sins. I could give you the reference, 2 Chronicles 33, 19. If you want to write it down, 2 Chronicles 33, 19. Some of your Bibles will say sin. Some of yours will say sins, plural. It just says his prayer also and how God was entreated of him in all his sin versus all his sins. Okay, but it's one of those words that you can say sin, meaning plural, without adding the S, right? The words can do that. So is that an error? No. Are they both right? Yes. And then uh, Nahum 3.16, uh, thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven, the cankerworm spoileth and flieth away. Some might say fleeth away. Fleeth is an older word of flieth away. Or I might have that backwards, but... I think I'm right with the fleeth being flieth. No, it's, it's definitely fleeth is, a, is an older writing of flieth. Same thing. It's the same thing. Some of your Bibles might say thoroughly. Some of yours might say throughly. This was another issue I found quite many years back in, in, in reading a scripture. And I got so mad. I was just like, man, I hate this Bible. It says thoroughly instead of throughly. But guess what? You look up the word thoroughly in dictionary, you know what it means? Thoroughly. <laughs> I mean, it literally, like I saw, I looked up in different dictionaries, and I literally saw the equal sign, and it said thoroughly. <laughs> like, equals thoroughly. Thoroughly was just the archaic writing of thoroughly. So if you notice that between two different Bibles that you're reading, KJV Bibles, one says thoroughly, one says thoroughly, you can have your preference, that's fine, but to say one's an error I think is wrong because it's not an error. Now, turn if you would to Joshua chapter 8 because I think that quotations within the Bible should be our guide as to what we should accept when we're looking at what is called the Word of God, right? We're, we're, and what I mean by that is, if we can see an example of someone quoting scripture, and there's an, an insignificant article missing to the understanding of that verse, but they're saying this is what it says, I think we could take to mean that that's what it says because that's what it means, and that's both the quotation and the original source are saying the same thing because they literally mean exactly the same thing and you can't make it mean anything different with the, with the omission or addition of a word there, right? Does that make sense? Say, Professor Burns, it sounds like you're tampering with the KJV. I'm not. First of all, I'm not suggesting making any changes to KJV, first of all. Second of all, how do you answer what we see in the Bible clearly? This is what I am using to form my belief of how everyone should be viewing translations and what you can call the Bible. Look at Joshua 8, verse 30. The Bible says, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel... As it is written in the book of the law of Moses. So we're getting a record here, and he's going to quote, and he says, look, this is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, over which no man hath lift up any iron. 
and they offered thereupon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Let's look at that reference. Keep, you keep your place there in Joshua 8.31. Look at Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27. These are the things that some people might try to show you to shake your faith in the Word of God. I look at it to get my understanding of the Word of God. It, it's a good idea to look up references that were referenced within the Bible itself. Because one, that'll just usually help you just gain a better understanding of what's being done anyways. But it's also great to know these things, right? So let's look at Deuteronomy 27. Because it said in Joshua 31, it's written in the book of Law of Moses. And this is the evidence, but then we need to make a conclusion based off of evidence. The evidence is right here in black and white for us. Verse number five, and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. This is what's written in our Bible, in Deuteronomy 27, five, in the law of Moses, what's written, an altar of stones, thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. It's saying the same thing, but now let's look at them very carefully. An altar of whole stones is what it says is written in this verse, when it says it's written in the book of Law of Moses, an altar of whole stones. Well, we see whole stones in verse 6, right? Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones. But does that say an altar of whole stones, or excuse me, uh, an altar of whole stones? It doesn't say an altar of whole stones. It says, thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones. Verse 5 says an altar of stones. It doesn't say whole stones in verse 5. We got that meaning there in verse 6, right? I mean, this is what it said. Am I, am, am I saying anything that's incorrect? I'm looking at the verses. And then after, in, verse, in Joshua 8.31, it says, Over which no man hath lift up any iron. Now, over which doesn't exist in Deuteronomy 27, verses 5 or 6. Those, those two words, over which. But then it says, No man hath lift up any iron. Whereas verse 5 of Deuteronomy 27 says, Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. And tool is italicized because that, that was added to give the meaning in English of what that verse means, that that word literally wasn't in the Hebrew, like the literal word, but it was added because it, it, it is what it was saying in the Hebrew. Does that make sense? These meanings are identical. The quotation from Joshua 8.31 to Deuteronomy 27, 5 and 6. The meanings are identical. Am I saying that we should translate, if we have a translation to do, just to translate it and not care about the words? No. But is this is what he's saying here, this is written in the book of the law of Moses, is that false? No, because it's what it says. And keep in mind, we're reading a translation of this too. It's not false. It, it means exactly what it says. And when we can see differences like this and, and the Bible's telling us that this is the way it is, I think we can say, okay, well, this God is acceptable with this quotation, since the Holy Ghost moved Joshua, or the, the author of the book of Joshua here in chapter 8, to be able to say this, because it's contained in our scripture, about previous scripture. Do you get what I'm saying here? Like, like, if that's acceptable within the confines of the Bible itself, and we can say that that's what, what was written there, then can't we apply that standard Today, when we're looking at other translations, saying, yeah, well, yeah, that's what it says. Even if it's not a verbatim word for word. Now, you have to be careful with that because you don't want to be going too far the other direction of just getting really loose 
of saying, well, yeah, I mean, you could just say whatever then. No, you can't just say whatever. It has to mean exactly the same thing, and you can't get another meaning out of it. Does that make sense? Like, like it's, just got, it's got to say the same thing. Another example, Second, uh, Second Chronicles 25. Second Chronicles 25, verse number 4. Second Chronicles 25, verse number 4, but he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, now it's a pretty strong word, saying, hey, look, this is written and this is what God said. Right? Amen. The fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. Well, that's reference from Deuteronomy 24, 16. And you could turn there, but essentially the difference is, instead of using the word die, it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father shall not be put to death. Yeah, I know, big difference, right? No difference, except one said die and the other one said put to death, be put to death. It's not wrong. But we want to be, again, when we see this, what is your understanding then of, of when it says that God said this and this is what's written? Does that mean that either, because you, you could come across saying a few different things. You can say, well, our translation is wrong then because it doesn't say exactly verbatim the same exact words. Right? It could mean, because these are poss possibilities. I'm just trying to think of all the possibilities. That could be one possibility. Well, our English translation is wrong because it didn't render this the same exact way. Two could be, well, no, the English is what the Hebrew says. Well, then maybe the Hebrew is wrong because it didn't say it exactly the same. Well, now you're starting to get into really big problems if you're going to say that, right? Because now you're just admitting then, like, well, the, this God didn't preserve his word at all. Or you can say, well, no, this actually is just fine because it, it is saying and meaning the exact same thing. Die or to be put to death means literally the same exact thing. And you don't have to say it that particular way for it to be true or not, you know, the word of God or anything like that. It's, uh, and, and one other difference, again, if you want to call it that, in verse, in Second Chronicles, it says, but every man shall die for his own sin. Whereas in verse 16 of Deuteronomy 24, it says, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. No, the article but isn't there. That, you know, it's a different structure, though. It's, it's got a colon, and then it just says every man. Whereas the, the way it was written in 2 Chronicles 25, no colon, and you add that word but there. To, you know. I know this is really detailed, and this is getting very meticulous. It might even be kind of dry, but... We need, to, we need to know about this. We want to have the right doctrine. We don't want to go too crazy and, again, get too emotional. And, and you know, I hope that you could, at the very least, and, and you don't have to agree with, with every nuance of what I believe. Like, like, I'm KJV only no matter what. Okay, that's the core doctrine. And if there's some nuance and some understanding that's a little bit different in your understanding of things, I don't have a problem with that. But I think we ought to be able to at least hear the matter and don't answer before you hear, right? And if you get so offended that you have to walk out before even hearing what is being presented as fact, you need to check your emotions and be able to understand like like this is what the bible says what are you you have to be able to answer for it what does it mean what does it say okay you could disagree with what i say but what does it mean then give me an answer and show me where i'm in error and i would hope 
that even after, after this long, especially if you've been coming here for a while, that you'd have, you'd have enough respect for me to say, I care about what Pastor Burson thinks, and I'm going to talk and, and be able to, to point out and show me my error if I'm wrong about this. I'd like to hear about it. But you have to present evidence. You know, it's not except, well, this is what I've always heard and what I've always taught and what I've always believed. That means nothing. That is not going to change my mind. A Muslim could come in and say, well, this is what I've taught. This is what I've always believed. This is what. Do you see what I'm saying? That doesn't hold water. We need to use our brains. We need to be able to think and, and look at the evidence and come to a conclusion. And we, again, we just don't want to go too far in any direction and getting outside the bounds of what is reasonable doctrine. Now, man, there's, I have so much. Let's look at one. All right, uh, yeah, I'm going to look at one more example. In Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to look at cross-reference that with Deuteronomy chapter 8. I tried not to do too many examples, but I still did too many examples. <laughs> I was researching all this stuff, and, and just I just want to express what, what, what I see in Scripture to you and what I've come to understand about these differences or these variations and how we ought to be able to take it as a whole and look at it and say, okay, here, you know, here's my view of, of the Bible, the King James Bible, of the translation, of the preservation, and, and all of these core doctrines, okay? Matthew 4, this was Jesus answering Satan, right? When he was being tempted in the wilderness, those 40 days that he was fasting, uh, which, which, a, n a whole another uh, great truth popped out to me when I was studying this, just a little bit unrelated, s slightly unrelated. Uh, Matthew four four. I'll, I'll explain it in just a second. The Bible says, but he answered and said, "It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God." This is Jesus Christ speaking. This is the record that we have of Matthew of what Jesus said when he was in the desert with. Satan, and he was talking to Satan, right? This is what we have to go off of. And if we believe that that's literally what Jesus said, which I do, now we know he wasn't speaking English. We're reading in English. He was speaking Greek, probably, to Satan, although we don't know that either, <laughs> technically, right? We, we assume that, but the, we know that the book of Matthew is written in Greek is what I'm saying, but but. Jesus was speaking to Satan, and it doesn't specify what language he was using when he was speaking to Satan, right? So, but God gave it to us in Greek. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is, of course, reference from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, where the Bible says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So the quotation doesn't say bread alone in Deuteronomy 3. It says bread only. Again, not a big deal, but look, when you're, when you're parsing words and looking at it, you know, you, I don't think we should get so crazy on that and so bent on, uh, on that that level of precision or detail when the Bible itself doesn't use that level of precision or detail in the quoting of itself. Does that make sense? So, so considering what is the word of God. And I would go far as to say this too. The King James Bible is just another revision of previous Bible starting with like Tyndale's version into English. Well, did Tyndale translate the word of God into English Yes, and was that, could you consider the Tyndale New Testament the word of God? I would say yes. Was it 
Without error, probably not. But you could still say that, there, you know, it was still the word of God and people could use that at that time because the differences or the, 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 the details, what you're going to see when you compare them are going to be so minor and so, so small, just, just overall and in general, that do we want to get that right? Yes, and that's why, you know, that we have this great regard for the King James Bible with all the great scholarship, with all the great effort that went into the translation itself to, to refine and to produce this great, excellent work that I do believe God had his hand in in making sure that he was able to deliver his word. 100%, like, like, there's, like I can't say enough about that, and, and absolutely and why? And for that reason also, we shouldn't just be, well, I mean, it just says this, and I just want to change that. Now, you're like, no, like, like there's no reason to tamper with it at all. There isn't. But we have to have just the proper understanding what the Bible is saying and, and what we should learn by that. Uh, you know, the other difference here is that instead, Jesus said out of the mouth of God, Deuteronomy 8.3 says, the Lord Okay, the Lord is God, right? And then he's, in, in Deuteronomy 3, says, doth man live, added that extra phrase. Jesus didn't quote that last phrase. But is it any different? I would say no. And, and what you want to be careful about, the people that, that really get hung up on the phrase, things that are different are not the same. Things are di I mean, I hear that over and over and over and over again. And look, there's some truth to that. Things are different are not the same. But how do you apply that? If you're applying that to the differences we see here, I would say, no, they are the same. Because they're not different. Like, the, like what Jesus said and what Deuteronomy 8, 3 says aren't different to the level of precision by which the Bible is showing us it's the same. Does that make sense? I mean, I, this is, you know, the, the sayings can then get stuck in our heads to where we come up with an inordinate understanding, uh, an, an, an inappropriate understanding of the Word of God. Now, to wrap it all up, this all is resulting from uh, a sermon Pastor Anderson preached on Deuteronomy. If you want to turn to Deuteronomy 21. And a comment made on social media. This is where, like, all of this stuff, like, like people kind of, some people freaked out, some people, you know, it, 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 what it did was it created a conversation, okay? And I actually like this conversation because I was able to then see where I think some people are getting too extreme in certain areas on, on this subject by itself, okay? And that we need to just have the proper view because some people are really freaked out about this. I'll tell you what he said, but, but, I don't think it's cause of freak out at all. And I'll explain why. But first, let's look at the passage. So verse number 22 of Deuteronomy 21, the Bible says, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And what happened was, while Pastor Anderson was preaching, he, got, he, he saw the wording here, he be to be put to death, and just thought that right off the bat just seemed like, that doesn't sound right, and asked to see someone else's Bible. Because as we've pointed out before, sometimes, like not even, not even just between Cambridge and Oxford, some prints of the Bible, Different publishers. You could have Nelson. You could have Cambridge. You could have all these different publishers of, of Bibles. Some of them will end up having typos in them. I mean, just, just gross typos. Right? Just like, and, and I'm not saying they're all throughout the Bible. If you find one like that, then just don't buy from that publisher. right? Like, don't, don't, you know, I wouldn't mess with that. But from time to time, because it's a, still a physical process, you're going to see books that have a wrong thing. So he was thinking, well, maybe it's just my literal physical Bible that I'm using. Check to see someone else. Like, oh, no, it says the same thing. So assume that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's fine. And this verse makes sense in English. Even though it's a little awkward, it still makes perfect sense. There's no wrong, there's no error grammatically with this whatsoever. It's talking about 
Uh, if he be to be put to death, that means someone is to be put to death. Someone is condemned, they're sentenced to the death penalty, right? That's what, this, that's what that means in English. They're, they receive the death penalty. Now, what the comment he made that caused all the controversy is because he was curious about this and wanted to investigate a little bit further, he, he looked at the Masoretic text of the Hebrew because he knows how to read Hebrew as well as Greek. And he looked at that and said, you know, the Hebrew just clearly says, and he be put to death. Not is sentenced to death, but is put to death. Okay. And says, yeah, well, this must then be a typo, a typographical error that has persisted like the other typographical errors that I already went over between 1611 and 1769 and that this one must not have been caught. Okay. But he never said, like, well, we should change this or anything else. He just says this is the evidence. Now, where I stand on that is I don't know Hebrew at all. And my stance is any change to the KJV, like even, even just a suggested change, I would not be in favor of unless there's enough ample evidence and enough experts to be able to say like, yeah, this is what this says. So like, since I don't speak Hebrew myself, I would never rely on one person to just say that that is correct or that is right. Does that make sense? Like because of, because of where we're at today. Now, could there have been a typographical error that persisted? I have no, pro I have no you know, real problem that that could have happened. Because when you think about it, what is, what is also, what is the real change there to the meaning? Nothing really. Because what's the point of this law? The point is to not to hang someone on that tree overnight. When someone's executed, you don't hang their dead body on the tree overnight. Why was that the law? Because that's what they would do for like desecration of a body or to point to, to like make a message out of killing somebody, right? And just, just put their body out there on display for everyone to see this person was put to death. And that was something that was done. And we have examples and stories of that in scripture. So whether so, if, if someone is condemned to death, they're going to be put to death. And if someone is put to death, they're put to death, right? So this, I believe, is clearly, and especially in light of other context, is talking about someone who has already been put to death, but the manner of execution wasn't necessarily they were hung on the tree and died in that manner, right? But you can get the same exact meaning whether you, it says, and he be to be put to death, or it says he be to be put to death. It's the same exact meaning. Now, in this situation, you could say, well, one is right and one is wrong, but it has no real impact at all on the meaning, I would say, like whatsoever. So to me, it's not a big deal. To me, it's also easy to see how it could have possibly been overlooked, just possibly. I'm not saying it was, and I'm not saying it is a typo. I'm just saying you can see how it could be. And if it is, is that some huge problem? Does that shake your faith? I hope not. I hope not. Let's be reasonable about this. Because, I, I mean, I've heard the, well, where does it all end? He's going to go back. It's like, that's not what's happening at all. There are no calls to go in now and just, well, let's just do a whole revision of the, you know, like, that's not what's being said. There's evidence that's being shown Someone's making a claim and saying, hey, here's the evidence that I see. Can we deal with that without freaking out? Or even just accusing someone of, a, you're a KJV Bible corrector. Because look, there's plenty of people out there that want to say, well, this is what it says in Greek, and what this really means is this, and it's different from what the translation says. And I'm against that, and we shouldn't be doing, no one should be doing that and say, well, this is what it really means, and blah, blah, you know, like, that's not... But that's not what he was saying either, though. It's not saying, well, this is what it really means. He was just saying that, like, that sentence structure in Hebrew is not the same as this because that says, this is talking about someone who's condemned to death versus someone who is put to death. You see what I'm saying? 
and we should be able to look at evidence and take it for what it is and say, okay, throughout the course of history and throughout the course of time, there is plenty of examples where individual copies have not been 100% perfect of every single letter of every single word. That's fact, it's fact. Okay, even today, even with modern technology, there's still who knows how many KJV translations of the Bible out there with typos, with errors, okay? It doesn't mean that the word of God is an error. It doesn't mean that the translation itself is an error. The printing, the physical printing of the book had an error in it. It wasn't translated wrong. It wasn't given wrong and it wasn't lost. It's been there the whole time. It's been preserved. And, not, and it's also not like the, the textual critics will say, like, well, it's preserved because they just say, like, well, since there's so many books that just all have this, you know, like, like that they're all there somehow. But it, that, that's too, like, almost, I don't want to say meaningless. It's, 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 it, it, you can't just point to be like, no, this is right. Like, there is no be a way to even set a standard of what's right. We have a way of setting standard of what's right. We, have a, we, we know what's been received throughout the churches. We know uh, uh, plenty in that regard. But again, I, I have to stop now because I've gone way over time. And like, as I said at the very beginning, this is a complicated subject. It's nuanced. There's so many little details to dig into and, and research and study and understand. And I don't say that in a way that's like, well, you just, uh, I say this, or you just have to answer. No, I, I want to encourage you to look into it for yourself and decide what you believe. But it's my job to never withhold anything that one, I believe or believe to be true, you know, obviously, especially, and I don't want anyone being offended in their faith, being shook up, being, being uh, you know, just troubled by facts because it might seem to be contradictory to what you've believed. And if it is a contradiction, if, if facts contradict what you believe, you're going to need to change your belief. If facts, and I'm not saying, you know, they have to be fact because a fact is true. Like some people might have their faith shaken by the theory of evolution, but that's not a fact, okay? The Big Bang is not a fact. Those are theories. That is someone's idea and their best explanation of how things got here. That is not a fact. But when you see true facts, because facts are reality, my friend, if that contradicts your belief, then your belief is wrong. It's plain and simple. So we look at the facts, we look at the evidence, and, and our belief should line up with the facts every single time. I mean, we we have the fact that God preserved his word. I believe that's a fact. The fact that Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried, rose again from the dead. Right? Facts. I believe that. Those aren't changing. They're facts. Facts don't change. But let's make sure our beliefs are in line with, with facts. And be ready to use our minds, be rational, and, and study it out and then make a conclusion on the matter. And, and I say this, just my last statement, because I mean this sincerely because this is a topic that gets very personal. And this is something that, that's a doctrine, it's a core doctrine, especially for people who've grown up with this for a really long time. And if, there's, if you have questions or issues or anything with what I'm saying, or you want further understanding. And look, I'm not the perfect orator in being able to express like, like these truths because some of them are nuanced and, and not easy to explain. You know, talk to me about it and let me know what, what you see the issues are. And if you think I'm wrong on this too, I'll, I'll, I'll still also welcome a reasonable discussion on what you think is wrong and show me where my error is. Because as I said at the beginning, I don't claim to know everything. Because I know I don't know everything. I'm confident in my belief on this. Very confident. 
However, if I'll listen to an atheist or if I'll listen to a, a, a Calvinist or I'll listen to some other doctrine, some other point of view, you better believe I'll listen to you. And I mean that. And, you know, just, just, you know, we can sit down and, 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 and talk about it. But, all right, that's enough. Let's close the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for, uh, for your word. We thank you for preserving your word. We don't have to doubt your word, that it is perfect. It is preserved, dear Lord. I pray that you will please just um, help us to, to understand the truth, what's correct to be on, uh, just, just so that we're not in error, dear Lord, and that uh, every error that we, that we espouse, every error that we cling to is, of course, a, a way for uh, people to, to attack just uh, even the ministry as a whole and, and the things that we stand for and things that we believe, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be pure in our doctrine and, uh, and sound in, in our beliefs, dear Lord, and uh, guide us and instruct us, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.